Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. Good morning. Good to see you all. Welcome to the journey. You know, I do like the scaled backstage, but who knew, who in this room is missing the Khalil cam this morning? Anybody? Yeah, yes. Okay, Khalil, put your hand down back there. It's not for you. I'm just kidding. He didn't raise his hand, but good morning. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, I'm glad that you've chosen this place to worship today. My name is Pastor Michael Jarbo, the lead pastor here at The Journey. I'm so thankful that you've come to worship uh, with us today. Um, uh, if you're a first-time guest, like Pastor Colin said, welcome. I'm glad that you're back. Uh, or excuse me, if you're a first-time guest... <laughs> Welcome here. If you're, this is your church home, welcome back. I'm glad that you are with us this week as we're in week two of Advent, as we're taking a bit of a different approach during Advent this year at MDUMC, and we're looking at some of the stories of the prophets. It's been really great. We were in Isaiah last week, and we're going to be in Isaiah this week. Uh, before we get reading in the scripture, I do want to just um, share with a few things kind of going on in the life of our church that I want y'all to be in the aware of. Um, I don't know if for those of you who have children, you may have gone back to the... Um, back room and not seen Miss Lauren today. Uh, this because earlier this week, Lauren uh, took a f fall down some stairs and broke her leg in two different places. Uh, she had surgery on it yesterday, and it's not the perfect time to break a leg during the season of Advent, she says. She texted me all morning uh, uh, on a bit of medication, I could tell. Um, um, and she was just saying, you know, tell everybody, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there, but I'll be there tonight for together for Christmas. I promise. I wanna, I'm like, T you just had leg surgery. Take it easy, please. So just be in prayer for Lauren during these days to come. It's a long road to recovery for her, uh, but we're going to be a church that prays for her, thinking about our children's um, director during this time. Another thing I want to share with you is that uh, a couple days ago, uh, we received word that Rusty Zide passed away. Um, Rusty Zide was our head usher over at the main campus uh, for a number of years and um, succumbed to um, cancer, uh, brain cancer, very aggressive brain cancer cancer, and he passed away on Friday night. Um, you might know Joe. Joe's uh, the tall guy that plays piano or bass. He plays all sorts of instruments. That's his father-in-law. And the Zide family is a very connected family here at the church. Caroline, uh, his daughter, uh, and his son have grown up in the youth group. And so uh, we mourn that loss. We know that that funeral for the uh, Rusty Zide will be this upcoming Friday, the 14th at 11 a.m. Um, and so please put that on your calendar if you want to be a part of that as we mourn. And be thinking of Joe and um, Rusty's wife, Dana, and, and all of the family members uh, of the Zide family, a family near and dear to us here um, at the church. And in, in, in that kind of vein, it, it's just been a, it's been a tough week, um, hasn't it? Uh, it's been a week uh, where uh, we've had a national day of mourning, um, um, and, and it feels uh, like it's a part of just what we need right now, is we need some time to take apart to mourn um, of course, the loss of President George H.W. Bush, but also just mourning the heaviness of the season. It's easy to throw lights up on our emotions, right? And just like say, it's, it's going to be fine. But the truth is, there's some difficult stuff that we deal with during the season. I know there's people in our own community who are dealing with great loss, people who have moved into hospice care, people who are just sad because a loved one isn't around this Advent season. And so I thought... Um, before we get started in today's sermon and read this Isaiah text, uh, a, a text filled with hope uh, that we can open and offer just a word of prayer before we get started. So let's pray. Loving God, sometimes we come kicking and screaming or crawling into the church. It's been a difficult week for all of us in some degree. But Lord, we know that thankfully this is a place where we can come and bring all of our junk. We can bring all of the stuff that's hurting in our lives and trust that our brothers and sisters to our right and to our left and behind us and in front of us are praying 
This is a community that prays. And so I ask, Lord, that this can still and always be a place where we can bring our setbacks, our difficulties, our sins, our doubts, our fears before you, trusting that you are a God who never leaves us, trusting that the table is not somebody's table, but your table, and that we can come to it openly and freely, knowing that we can be nurtured and nourished by your body and your blood. Make that real to us today, Lord, as we come into this place. We pray things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, Isaiah, back at it. We were in chapter 64, basically at the very end. There's 66 chapters in Isaiah last week. And now we're going to go right back up to the beginning. We're going to be in chapter 11. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 10. Uh, You may hear some uh, remotely familiar images that are associated with Advent, but just uh, take heart, as the scripture series is called, and and let these words sort of roll over you as you hear them. If you you have your uh, Bibles, feel free to open up. If, If not, you can follow along on the screens here. Friends, I'm glad that you are with us in worship. Here we go. Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness a sash around his waist. The wolf will lie with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will be fed with the bear. The, their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on, the, on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. Together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. I was trying to think back, and I was wondering... um, Have I ever told you about my first date with Leslie? Uh, It happened 14 years ago this past week. Uh, We were eight years old and we were going, I'm just kidding. We weren't eight, we weren't eight. But uh, it was just a little age game with me as I move in my thirties. We were, uh, it was December 6th of 2004. And uh, I picked her up on time in my Oldsmobile Cutlass Classic, which I know I've talked about here before in the past. Um, I got there uh, right on time. I walked inside uh, to her house where her father, who happens to be in the audience today, shook my hand firmly as I escorted his oldest daughter to my crummy Oldsmobile. Uh, We went and had a sketchy at best dinner at Hunan Dynasty, uh, which is a a Chinese place which uh, no longer exists because it disintegrated in a uh, uh, a kitchen fire that's still unexplained today. Rest in peace. Um, It actually sat on the second floor of of a big shopping center, which below it had a blockbuster rest in peace, um, for other reasons. Uh, And we split chicken fried rice that night, I remember, and we read each other's fortune cookies, um, not knowing what our futures might hold for each other in high school. And and then I uh, got us back in the car, and we, we headed to the AMC theater to go and watch the cinematic classic Shrek 2. Now, I know what you're thinking. Jarbo, come on. 
Shrek 2. That's the movie that you choose, and I want to explain fully to my logic to everybody here in this room today. I don't do scary movies. Uh, and I am not going to scream on this date that I'm trying to impress. So M. Night Shyamalan's The Village was out of the picture. Um, the other movies that were available were Troy. I think that's Brad Pitt maybe was in that guy. Uh, Raising Helen and uh, The Notebook. And those were no's. And you all are saying, hold again, Jarbo. The Notebook. That's a movie full of romance. Why not take her there? And I had thought about logic there as well. And just to let you know, I'm going to let uh, Ryan Gosling do his thing a few theaters over and let my date focus on me, okay? Um, and so um, the, other, the, the other movie was Napoleon Dynamite, but I went opening night to Napoleon Dynamite, so that was out of the question too. Yes, great movie. I need to preach about that sometime. Um, so Shrek 2 was it. And Leslie graciously <laughs> approved. Um, and I guess things worked out, right? Um, so um, the whole Shrek series is, a, is, is great, uh, in my opinion. I have, hopefully many of you have seen at least one of the Shreks. Um, it's one of, those, uh, one of the very first animated films to blur the lines between children humor and adult humor right? And you got to see all of your favorite nursery rhyme and like fictional characters uh, like in full form. Uh, but they weren't as you remembered them. I, the, the movie opens with this scene uh, with all these fairy tale creatures seeking refuge in a nearby swamp after Lord Farquaad banished them from the kingdom. And Shrek realizes when he's looking out about all of these fictional animals uh, that his home uh, his place of solitude has, has been compromised unexpectedly by this herd of fictional beasts. I mean, there were blind mice in his food. There was a big bad wolf in his bed. Three little homeless pigs were running all over the place and a panicking Pinocchio, just to name a few. And this would not stand for Shrek. This big green ogre was set in his ways. The idea of living alongside fairy tales just couldn't be sustainable, or even beyond that, believable. And I gotta tell you, I've had this scene sort of stuck in my head all week while reading this text from Isaiah, which shows you what goes into putting work into writing a sermon my, in my mind. It's just kind of plain weird, uh, especially during this chaotic season of Advent where a bunch of my colleagues in the city who are preaching are preaching today on Mary and the angel Gabriel and the journey to Bethlehem. And I'm stuck in the Old Testament with this goofy prophet wandering through the wilderness amidst destruction and gloom hundreds upon hundreds of years before the coveted manger scene that all of us love and cherish during this season. Now, there's nothing Advent E, there's nothing Christmas E about this guy, Isaiah. I don't know about you, but have you noticed that prophets are sort of strange people? I mean, I, when I think about prophets on my own, my first mind goes to um, John the Baptist, right? As a Christian, my mind goes there. He's one of the first prophets we see in the Gospels. Uh, John the Baptist is sort of, for Christians like you and me, that, that cousin who you have to remind every year at Christmas dinner not to say anything lewd or political when grandma's at the table. You know, you know the guy. Like, he's sort of just out there. And as the scripture reads, you know, he wears camel's hair like we wear Patagonia vest. <laughs> and he chews on locusts like for a pregame snack. John the Baptist was the guy, if you remember in Luke's gospel, who said to the crowd, you brood of vipers. Talk about that to start a conversation with. You brood of vipers. John the Baptist was one who re rebuked Herod and all the evil government around. He reminded the crowds around him that, look, I baptize by water, but the one who is to come, the Messiah, Jesus, does not baptize with water. He baptizes with fire of the Holy Spirit. I love the guy, but he's a bit odd. 
But you have to be kind of odd to be a prophet. I mean, as a prophet, you're tasked with this incredible, unique calling to receive the word of God and to speak it into existence. And a lot of times it's like, hey, everything that happened to you, let it go. Because there's something new on the way. And as scripture shows, God tends to come to those people who are pretty strange. God doesn't make prophets out of the mighty or the rich. Not the power dealers of the day. Not even the religious or civic leaders of the time. But the word of God comes through weirdos in the wilderness. Someone on the margins of humanity. Someone we least expect to have something to say. Somebody we've written off. So who do you think in today's world are the prophets of our society? The word of God does indeed come. But it might not be from who you expect or what you expect. So I had to keep that in mind this week as I, as I read this scripture because like Shrek, I, I looked around my cozy Christmas decorated home and was interrupted as I read the text by this strange fairy tale that Isaiah is depicting in the scene. You remember the words I read earlier? I'll, I'll remind you. This is sort of my notated uh, version. He says, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion will be seen together. A cow will eat with the bear. That's right, not a bear will eat a cow. A cow will eat with the bear. And a young child shall play near a cobra's nest. And there will be no harm or destruction. And when I read those words for the first time, I wanted to be like, get out of town. I have no time for make-believe, Isaiah. Old delusional Isaiah trying to be and think of all these weird things to say. The idea of a predator lying beside prey, no, eating beside its prey is too far out for me. Sure, I'll watch a YouTube video of a dog cuddling with a cat or a tiger nursing piglets or a lioness adopting an antelope family. I'll even watch a video of a squirrel on water skis, which actually exists. It's real. It's weird, but it's awesome and bizarre all at the same time. But y'all, Isaiah's depiction, I can't get behind. You can take that off the screen now. <laughs> I can't. And I won't. It's just not believable. But then I had to begin to ask myself, why, why am I so hung up on what's believable and what's not? Why do I shackle myself to reality when reality can be quite miserable? I mean, think about it. News of terror and violence and riots and economic unease and climate catastrophes have begun to be just what we expect to see on the news, which maybe is why a recent study came out that in the year 2018 has marked the highest spike in antidepressant pills in the past decade. Why? I think maybe the logic behind that is that I can't fix the outside world. Maybe I'll just fix what's within. We crave certainty so much that we'll do whatever it takes to get it. If it's a pill or a blind belief in something that gives me security, I'll do it. I'll take it. Whatever I can do to feel steady in this crazy, crazy world. All this uh, animal talk from Isaiah got me thinking about my friend Lindsay from college. Uh, Lindsay is a zoologist and uh, what's known as an animal ambassador at the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans, Louisiana. 
Um, here's a picture of her with uh, some marsupial there. Um, cute little animal there. I like that. Uh, she was actually just on the Today Show uh, about a month ago, um, surely spreading cheer about all the good things going on at the Audubon Zoo. Uh, but this was a different story not too long ago. I don't know if you remember this past July, uh, there was news that came out that uh, early in the morning at the Audubon Zoo, a jaguar escaped from its cage and went and killed nine different animals. Lindsay was the first one interviewed when this happened. <laughs> Remember seeing her there. And the news reporters would just keep asking, I mean, why? Uh, if a jaguar was hungry, why did it not just kill two animals and eat them? Why go around and simply kill nine animals for just the sake of killing? And the reports came out from the experts connected to what happened. It says that, that when a wild animal meets a human-altered environment, when, when, a, when a normally wild and free animal's natural inclination is stunted, it can begin to shift the way it sees its habitat and it sees others as enemies that need to be destroyed. I wonder if the same can be said about us, especially those of us in the church. Have we stunted ourselves to only believing what we can grasp and control? Have we let ourselves be locked into cages of certainty rather than fully living into the freedom God gives all of creation? If we let presumptions rule, and if we let expectations limit our potential, then we might begin to think that we can hurt or destroy anyone or anything around us. There's a pastor and author named Nadia Bowles Weber who talks about the difference between expectations and expectancy. She writes this, expectations are when we think we know what's going to happen in the future and who the good people are and who the bad people are and what rewards the good people will get and what punishment the bad people will get. But expectancy isn't about the certainty of faith. Expectancy is about the mystery of faith that Christ has died and Christ is risen and Christ will come again. Expectations are when we think we already know the outcome. But expectancy is when we are open to whatever the outcome might be, whatever it is, because we know in the end God will be with us. Expectancy is trusting that the story is bigger, that God is already present in the future that we are all anxious about. This is expectancy. Expectancy is to anticipate that God fulfills God, God's promises. Ah, I love the distinction between the two. Because you see, expectancy is the fuel to the vehicle of the prophets. That's what Isaiah is expressing here in the scripture that we read. And expectancy sounds bizarre because it is. Isaiah's words are not a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale. He's foretelling God's future reign on earth. And in God's future kingdom, what we know, what we believe, what we hold to be true is turned on its head. Isaiah's words aren't meant to be cute and cuddly. His words are to signify hope. Hope? Hope? How can you believe in hope? Said people who had certain expectations of Isaiah. Everything you love is under your feet and the enemy is going to come back. But Isaiah was a prophet, y'all. They were expected to be counted out. But the word of God still comes and it is a word of justice and peace that rolls down like waters in a dry land in places that are despair-ridden and with, filled with unrest. It is a word not just of personal healing, but it's a word of a coming reign of God. It's a word saying, 
The story of God and the story of God's people is bigger than what's happening right now. So wait on the Lord whose day is near. Be strong. Keep watch. Take heart. Isn't that what Advent is all about? Expectancy over expectations. Advent is about staying awake to the mystery of faith rather than locking yourself up to the certainty of faith. Advent is a public confession that the story of God is big, far bigger than what we can control. It's a story that reaches back in the past to Christ's birth, but it also reaches forward to the future of God with Christ coming back again, reminding us all that God is not done with us yet. This is a hope that we can cling to, friends. It's not an escapist hope, like get me out of here hope. Quite the opposite. It is a hope of a people who heard an impossible rumor that there is life beyond death and hope beyond suffering. Something is always possible to be new. So how do we make that change today? How can we wait in this life right now with expectancy. For Isaiah, the transformation from a culture of fear to a world of peace begins with a stump. (laughs) Out of something that appears finished and lifeless and left behind comes a sign of, of new life. That's how hope is started, says Isaiah. It emerges like a little tiny leaf in an unexpected place. And the stump of Jesse, which Isaiah speaks about, is is filled with historical and theological value. King David's father was Jesse. And although King David's kingdom is being destroyed, the family tree is not done yet. From its roots, a a branch will sprout out from the Davidic line. And, And we as Christians believe that from that root comes the birth of a new king who we know as Jesus. And this is a different kind of king. This is a king who rules with peace. One who judges with righteousness and brings justice to the poor and to the meek. One who lets aggression and weakness fall down and turn over. One who allows predator to lie, to eat, to nestle with its prey. What a sight. What a sight that will be. But how shall we see it? In the late 18th century, in his last days, Edward Hicks uh, was a Quaker, and he decided to go into painting. He, He was sort of just painting signs on different doors of different businesses, but he decided to go a little bit deeper and dig into the, uh, the practice of making portraits. And he was a devout Christian, being a, a, a Quaker, and he loved, marveled at the words of Isaiah 11. And so he drew this painting, which is known as the Peaceable Kingdom. Maybe you've seen it before uh, somewhere. It's actually right now in, in Virginia in a, a museum. And if you look over there, all the animals are present, <laughs> Every single one, the lion and the goat and the the snake and the leopard, the cow, all of them are there. And and there's a child among them. But, But what's most notable is the scene going on to the left. It's a picture depicting William Penn in the Delaware Valley signing a peace treaty with the first Native Americans. It was a sign that Edwards Hicks saw of the possibility of potential peace in the earth in which he knew. So I I wonder, if you were the artist today, what would you draw on the left side of the picture? Would it be believable? May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. Oh 
Loving God, we thank you for the candle of peace today. In this chaotic world that we live in, it's and this chaotic time of life we live in, it's sometimes hard to stumble upon peace. But your prophets remind us that peace looks different than what we can comprehend, and that's okay. Because God's reign in and on our earth changes everything. It flips the script on what we know. And so may we ponder that this Advent. Ponder what the possibility of peace looks like, of justice looks like on earth. And as the song says, remind ourselves that it begins with you and with me. May we be vehicles of peace this week through all the world. Amen.